Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mate Tikindalean. I'm a second year PhD student at the Coast Institute of Archaeology. And before we begin, I would like to read a brief statement. The Coast Institute at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tova Angar, the Los Angeles Basin and South China Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honukvetam ancestors, Ahihirom elders, and Eyohihinkem, our relatives, relations past, present, and emerging. Okay. Tracy Mayfield is a lecturer at the University of Southern California. Dr. Mayfield has been directing archaeological and ethnographic field schools in Belize since 2009 and an old Providence and Santa Catalina Islands, Colombia, um, since 2017. She's a broadly trained four field uh, anthropological archeologist with specializations in zoo archeology span and ceramics, who is currently focused on British colonialism in the Western Caribbean. She received a PhD in anthropology archeology span from the University of Arizona in, in 2015 an MA in Historical Archaeology from Illinois State University in 2009, and a BA in Anthropology and Archaeology from DePaul University in 2007. Dr. Mayfield's current research interests center on landscapes of production, extraction, and mercantilism in the Americas. While much of Dr. Mayfield's research output is focused on post-European contact sites, her research and teaching milieu rely heavily on knowledge of pre-contact history and material culture. Simply put, without a deep understanding of indigenous and diasporic communities, histories, social politics, materiality, and sp spatiality, the events that came after European contact would, sorry, would hold little meaning if studied in isolation. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mayfield with the virtual round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was a fantastic introduction. In fact, you've covered most of my first slide, which will probably make all of our participants really, really happy. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. And um, thanks to all of you to, who came out or are coming out to watch as well. Um, so I will get started. Um, this presentation, um, is uh, based on work by myself and also Scott Simmons, who's with the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, we've also written um, about these two sites as well. So he could not be here today. I was hoping he would, but um, he's not gonna be able to be. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover it um, for him. Um, so just to start out a little bit, to give you a little bit of, of background knowledge, um, during the 19th century, Latin America and the wider Caribbean was a hotbed of trade and commerce driven principally by extractive industries such as agriculture, in this case, principally sugar, uh, but not solely, and also hardwood collection. Um, these are both two things that are still um, being uh, produced and extracted um, in this area today. Um, such ventures required large injections of capital into the creation and maintenance of productive landscapes, as well as specialized infrastructure used for housing and feeding the workers who provided labor and management, which in turn created rich archaeological contexts that can give us insight into the daily lives of people who were active in these spaces in the past and also over time. And it is during this period that British colonists established settlements at two Belizean sites that I will present here today. At Lamanai, an inland forest site, which is located in what is now the Orange Walk district of Northwestern Belize to plant sugarcane and harvest logwood and mahogany. And at San Pedro town, located off the coast of Belize on Ambergris Key to cultivate a uh, coconut plantation. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of um, just a, an introduction, although um, Matei did a wonderful job with this. Um, these are some pictures of me in the field. Not all should probably be headshots, but they make me feel like I'm there. Um, so as, as was already introduced, I have a BA and a PhD in anthropology and archaeology, uh, but also I have an MA in historical archaeology in particular. Um, and have a history and memory conf uh, um, um, concentration that I had uh, that I did during my PhD program. 
Um, I'm an anthropological archaeologist. Um, my focus is on the historical period in the Americas, mostly British colonialism, but clearly where I work, I, I run into also Spanish colonialism. So it's something that is included in the work that I do. Um, I work closely with local populations. I collect oral histories along with material and spatial archaeological data. Um, and as um, Matei also said, my specialties are ceramics and zooarchaeology. Um, I first worked at sites in Chicago in the Bahamas then Missouri, North Carolina, um, Arizona, and New Mexico. And um, I'm also currently working in Belize since, I cannot believe it's been since 2008. That, that's crazy how fast this has gone. Um, and I recently began a new project in Colombia um, on Old Providence and Santa Catalina Islands. I want to mention here, because um, it's something I'll talk about toward the end of the presentation, um, it was actually recently hit by uh, Hurricane Iota and completely devastated. Um, it's off the coast of Nicaragua and was hit by a Category 5 before it hit the coast. So um, that's kind of taken up some of my time this week. Obviously, archaeology isn't the most important recovery is, um, but just wanted to, to mention that. Um, and my interests are in plantations, landscapes of production, um, household archaeology. I really want to get at what is the experience of kind of everyday people um, instead of uh, maybe the most important people that, that make their way into the documentary record. So those are the things that I want to know about. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on historical archaeology because I know some of you are like, well, how is this different than prehistoric archaeology? I would argue it's not that much different, um, but for academic purposes, we do separate these two things, um, you know, to a certain degree. Um, so historical archaeology is a few things. One, it's a period of time. Um, it's defined as a culture with formal writing systems. Um, usually in the Americas, it's considered post-1492, uh, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, clearly, this is problematic. People had writing systems uh, before Columbus landed in, um, you know, what they called the New World. Um, so I, I use this kind of, you know, a little bit because it's how it's, it's written about and how it's understood, but I want to say that it is a problematic um, concept here in the Americas, um, historical archaeology being 1492 and, and past. Um, so our methods, it's also a method and methodology. Um, we use multiple independent and comparative lines of evidence. So we use documents, artifacts, art, maps, anything that we can possibly get our hand on, hands on, we will use um, to try to understand a context. Uh, we have very targeted research, so heavy use of guiding problem orientation and specific, very specific research questions. Um, also, and I, I stress here in the Americas, um, we also recognize that the Industrial Revolution created a great deal of material homogeny. Um, things started to look the same, right? People were using the same stuff. Um, so what we do to kind of get past that is we look at really, we, we focus on high frequency behaviors. So foodways and, and disposal practices, because if everything looks the same, how do you tell the difference between two households or two sites? Um, if the if everything kind of looks the same. So you have to focus on things that have a really, really, really big data set. And eating and throwing things away creates a very huge data set. Um, so I'm more interested in that than I am buildings, um, to be quite honest. I'm, I'm very interested in trash, uh, for sure. So things that people do multiple times a day, not necessarily special events. Um, it's also a theoretical foundation. It's grounded in the idea that people, places, and things are increasingly connected in time and space in a globalized modern world. But depending on time and place and local populations, how colonialism was accomplished or not, um, I want to say that too, it didn't always go well, um, varied to a very large degree. So both the local and the global are really, really important to um, our interpretations as historical archaeologists. Um, so a little bit on problem orientation. Again, I mentioned um, relationships between people, materials, and space in an increasingly globalized world. Um, understanding what happened here as opposed to somewhere else, even though it's in that same, um, you could say, colonial theater. Um, things happen differently depending on the, where they were. Um, and to recognize that colonialism was not a uniform phenomena, um, rather many variable phenomena. So it's historical, cultural, and political economic descent of native populations changes how, how you know, colonialism happened. Um, so the makeup of labor populations too, which were not always local. 
um, the origin of capital funding were these governmental private organizations, religious institutions that were doing the colonizing. These would create different contexts. When? 1650 or 1850, um, they had very different strategies. So it's important to understand when and where something was happening. Um, who? British, Spanish, Portuguese, all of these different groups had different strategies. So it's important to understand how all of these things fit together. Um, and again, variable relationships and dialogues between the global and the local, both being important manifestations um, of these different sites. Um, so again, here, historical archaeological data, um, anything we can possibly get our hands on. <laughs> um, we will take it. Independent lines of evidence are great. Um, we do what we can with everything that we, we, can, we can find for sure. Um, and I know I mentioned here, or I mentioned earlier, um, the standard of, uh, standardization of materials during the Industrial Revolutions. I'm using an S on the end there because it happened in different places at different times. There's less wear type variation. So there's more of the same stuff out there. Um, so again, we have to find ways to make the data meaningful. Um, and that's something that I'm going to talk about here when I'm comparing these two sites. Um, so, <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a little bit of allergies today, so I apologize. I'm, if I look like I'm crying, I'm actually I'm not. <laughs> At least yet, I don't know. It could happen. You never know. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Lamini and San Pedro Town, both sites in Belize. I've got a map that I'll show you as well. Um, Today's presentation use, uh, utilizes artifact and faunal data collected at Lamini over the past 40 years, um, along with new materials excavated at Lamini in 2014 uh, by, by me and a group of students. I'm um, also in San Pedro town in 2017. I will compare and contrast these two sites situated in very different landscapes um, that were also both within the Latin American Caribbean uh, British colonial industrial complex. Um, please note also that while both sites had long-term uh, complex Maya occupations and still do, um, they did not disappear by the way, there's nothing, um, there were no aliens or any of that, they still live there. Um, I will only be discussing the 19th century settlements today, uh, but just wanna recognize that, that the, these are Maya sites that we're talking about. Um, so at these sites during the 19th century, colonists utilized a wide Wide variety of imported products, which, which can tell us a lot about everyday life at that time. Along with cooking, storing, and serving vessels, fresh beef and pork, um, and bottled, canned, or barreled products such as soda water, salted pork, condiments, and potted meat were consumed in great quantities. The residents of 19th century Lamini and San Pedro Town were also active consumers of uh, tobacco and bottled alcoholic beverages. Additionally, earned labor money was used to purchase bottled medicines, health and hygiene products, for instance, chamber pots, tools and wearable objects such as buttons and boot heels. So I thought I would show you a quick map here as well. Um, Lamini is, is located right here on the New River. Um, it is a, an inland site. Um, it is located on water. Uh, most, most of the sites were, but then San Pedro Town is out here on Ambergris Key. Um, so just environmentally, they're in very different biomes. Again, still in the same um, milieu of what was happening, but different biomes. So the Lamini natural environment, um, Lamini or Indian Church as it was known in the 19th century is located in Northwestern Belize. It is a thickly forested subtropical inland site um, situated on the Western shore of New River Lagoon. Um, it has moist shallow limestone soils and has likely been impacted by flooding frequently during its long history. Um, and I pause here for a brief public service announcement. Uh, it's important to mention here that this particular monkey is a jerk. Um, please note that he is prone to howling at visitors and throwing poop. So please avoid this individual at all costs. I'm telling you, he's such a jerk. So um, this is, you'll, you'll recognize him because he'll be, he'll be angry if you go visit that site for sure. Um, so this is just another map that I wanted to show briefly. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on this. Um, this is a map of Lamini, the entire Maya site. Um, as you can see here, it's it's got, I think, seven or eight pyramids. It, it, it's a huge site. Um, this area is where uh, the, the British kind of colonialism or colonial settlement was. 
Um, and then this is a blow up of it where the sugar mill is up here. There are residential features kind of coming down to the south. Um, this star right here is the 2014 excavations. I picked this for a few reasons. One, it was just right between two really rich sites. Um, it also had a breeze. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, there was a breeze coming off the lake and that, that appealed to me. Um, so one of the things that the students a lot of times ask me when I showed them this is why didn't they build at the whole site? Why didn't they take the site over from the Maya? Uh, well, it would be really hard to get rid of seven to eight pyramids. Um, they had to build a plantation in an area that wasn't already covered. Um, so really they, they were sitting right directly in a Maya site this whole time. It would have been very clear um, who had been there the longest, I will, I will definitely say. Okay, a little bit of an historical overview here. Um, early in the 19th century, British colonists established a sugar plantation at Lamini, which had long been and con continued to be long after uh, the demise of the sugar venture, an area exploited for logwood and mahogany. No formal records of British occupation exist until 1837, when 200 acres were given to the British under the Indian Church Plantation Grant in order to plant sugarcane and build a sugar mill at the site. While sugarcane may have been planted soon after the original grant, the mill itself was not in operation until at least 1866. Um, this is the metal stamp date on the, the sugar mill. So we know that it couldn't have been before that time. Um, it may have only been utilized till around 1868 for around two years um, when British soldiers stationed at Lamanai during an Akiche uprising, so a Maya group uh, uprising, um, got drunk, tried to start up the mill and blew it up, um, which killed at least one soldier. So I'm, I am not convinced it was used after this, although I have a grad student who is, so it's really kind of fun. Uh, we argue back and forth. Um, the last known documented occupants of the, the, this particular plantation um, were the soldiers um, stationed at the site in 1868. So we don't really know what happened after that as, as far as um, the documents. Um, so these are just some pictures of some of the work that we've done here. Um, it's very hot. I will tell you, it is very hot and humid um, working here. Um, this is a wall that we found literally a day before we were finishing. You always find some piece of architecture when you're about to leave. It happens every time. And so we did our best. We And it turned out it was very, very short. So we didn't have to leave the unknown. Um, this is also just a drawn picture of the wall. We both take pictures and, and draw things because you get different types of detail. Um, I did want to post this one picture here. Um, I had uh, walked off the site a little bit and found what I thought was a fire pit because um, it was all filled up, um, but we dug it out. It's definitely not a fire pit. There's no fire cracked rock. Um, it is not a well. Um, this bottom right here is actually a limestone. So we went all the way down. The only thing that we found in here, and it's about 110 centimeters, um, was one piece of concrete in a human tooth. I have no idea. If you have any ideas of how to interpret that, let me know. I, we, I've, I've shown this and nobody even knows what this is. Um, so it's kind of a weird object. Um, and I, I do not know what happened there, but probably something pretty weird. Um, okay, sorry, let me just, here we go. And here's some more artifacts as well. Um, I just wanna kind of show you the kind of things that we dig up. It's very, it's like what we'd find in trash cans now, plates and cups and bowls. Um, lots of um, booze bottles. <laughs> I would say that's mostly what we excavate is, is booze bottles. This is a gin bottle. Um, a lot of pipes, smoking pipes, um, some like tinned, uh, tinned meats as well. We find these um, and also medicine bottles. These are some just a, a small bit of the medicine bottles we found. Although at that period of time, I would probably put medicine in the booze category because it's mostly like liquid cocaine and opium. Um, so it wasn't really meant to make you better. It was just kind of meant to make you not care so much. Um, so a little bit about um, San Pedro as well. Um, the San Pedro site is located on Ambergris Key, the northernmost offshore barrier uh, island um, along the coast of Belize. The island is 39 kilometers long, no wider than four kilometers at any point. Um, a large variety of fish and shellfish species native to, uh, native to the um, barrier reef were exploited by the ancient Maya and these resources were also exploited by groups that came after that as well. Um, so a little bit of a, a historical overview here. Um, the early occupation of San Pedro town began with ownership rights of the island claimed by the Von Olafen family by a squatter's rights around 1850. Um, 
the caste wars, uh, which was in 1847 to 1855. I wish I could go over that more. It's actually, that's a whole class in itself. Um, hampered development in the 19th century, but sustained occupation and steady population growth was resumed by 1855. San Pedro is first mentioned in historical documents around 1850. Uh, and after a series of owners and subsequent bankruptcies, the Blake family purchased the island in 1869 and started a coconut plantation. Um, the lands were distributed between British families who had fled the caste wars um, internal, in, you know, internally inland. Um, and then the, um, which began a period of construction and increased permanent settlement. So settlement has, um, uh, continue to this day. It's it's uh, a very vibrant place to this day. Great place to do archaeology. Um, so just a few more pictures here. You can tell it's a little bit different. If you look down here, we've got a lot of sand um, compared to what you would be seeing out in the jungle, which is mostly organic materials. Um, this soil, and I'll explain why this is important in a second, is much less acidic than you get out in the jungle, um, which does change the types of preservation that we have. Um, and also these are just uh, pictures of some of the artifacts. I think you can tell they're much more vibrant. Again, um, you know, how well these things hold up. Um, what's interesting because this is a beach site where there's a lot of movement in the soil um, and, and, you know, the, because there's sand and, and for other reasons, um, this actually came out of one level of one unit. Um, what's important to see here is these are Maya artifacts that were completely mixed in with everything else. These come from the late, uh, well, the post-classic period, so around 900 AD um, up through the Spanish period. Um, these are all um, uh, English, you know, British. Um, these all look very familiar. Probably some of you have some of this in your home, some of these um, decorations. And again, lots of booze bottles. But this is a huge amount of time that is all mixed together. Um, one thing I will note here, and we still don't know why, um, we did not find any Spanish artifacts, even though the Spanish would have been there after um, you know, post, you know, classic Maya and then the English and we haven't found any. So we, we don't know why, it's still a question. Um, you would expect to find kind of an equal amount of Spanish um, uh, materials in there and we did not. Um, these are some uh, bone artifacts that came from San Pedro. I don't have a lot. And again, I'll explain why from Lamanai, uh, but they were exploiting literally anything um, especially um, marine animals. So this is all fish. Um, this is actually a manatee right here, um, which looks amazingly like cow bone till you figure out it's, it's different. Um, that's, I guess, why they call them sea cows, right? Um, so I wanted, and, and then one more thing, this has nothing to do with today's presentation. These are some Maya artifacts we found and they are absolutely stunning. Um, so I really like to show you all this. Um, these are actually fishing weights. Um, these are too, but these are kind of, the later ones that came along. Um, these are just ceramic sherds that were notched. Um, these are for those circular nets that they throw out. So I just thought I would, and these are obsidian blades, um, really good examples of obsidian blades. So I thought I'd show, show that off a little bit. All right, so let's get into the meat of this conversation. Um, so what I wanna do is talk a little bit about both sites. You can see here, they have pretty much equal numbers of artifacts, which is always good um, when you're doing statistics. That's always helpful. It makes you feel a lot more confident. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so the Lamanai um, post-Columbian artifact assemblage consists of 4,765 objects and dates from approximately 1775 through present day. The mean occupation date, and, and we what we do is we, we take ceramics and there's a bunch of formulas we use, and it tells you probably when the highest occupation was going on at a site. Um, it surprisingly works surprisingly well if you have a big data set. Um, so the mean occupation date was 1854. Um, this is based on ceramic dates of production. Um, the Lamanai assemblage and built environment um, includes a sugar mill, um, labor and supervisors housing and churches, um, which suggests that while the number of people living there and working there at the site fluctuated over time, there has been continuous occupation of the site um, from pre-Columbian times to the present. This is not a landscape that is ever kind of, people have not disappeared off this landscape since people arrived at this landscape. So the San Pedro post-Columbian artifact assemblage consists of 4,693 objects and dates approximate from approximately 1720 instead of 1775 through present day. 
The mean occupation date is 1893, so a little bit later. Um, the bulk of the colonial artifacts were produced 1840. I want to mention that here. Um, 1840 is an important date because that's when a lot, that's when the Industrial Revolution, at least here, uh, really took off. Um, and so objects would have kind of been making it there faster and, and entering the record a little bit faster. Um, Although some uh, ceramic wares, specifically white wares, um, are things that are still produced today. So those tend to throw off the numbers a little bit um, later in time. Um, so I think it's probably an earlier date, but I just don't really have any proof of that right now. Um, so um, only one feature was found in excavations at the San Pedro site. It was a tabby wall, which is a kind of a rudimentary form of, of, of um, cement. Um, concrete. Um, it's kind of a cheap version of it, but we only found one wall um, instead of all the other buildings like we found at, at Lamanai. Um, the, the artifact dates are consistent with the late colonial history of Ambergris Key um, and the ceramic data, which I'm going to be detailing further, along with the high volume and variety of alcoholic beverage containers, soda bottles and medicines, and low percentage of construction materials, um, probably point to this being a dump site or a site where multiple homes were using to throw things away. There's just a ton of variation here, which I'll show you um, in the next couple of slides. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, artifact categories. So what are artifacts being used for? How can we categorize those? Um, in San Pedro, the bulk of materials are related to foodway activities. So food storage, preparation, serving vessels, bottles, cans, all of these things. Um, construction, household, health and hygiene, uh, personal, uh, materials as well uh, make up the uh, remaining portion, portion of the assemblage. Personal items would be things that one person would use. Um, so a comb or a button or a piece of clothing um, that's a little different than just a household item. Uh, Lamini, um, there's a similar pattern seen at, uh, at the San Pedro site. The bulk of the Lamini assemblage was also related to foodways. The large percentage of food made materials, along with a higher percentage of architectural and household objects, um, in comparison to what we see at the San Pedro site, was expected though, as 19th century Lamini was a working plantation where people both lived and worked, as compared to maybe a multi residential midden um, or, tran uh, or transitory space like a hotel or a restaurant uh, might have been at the San Pedro site. Um, so ceramic um, forms, um, so, you know, ceramic forms are important. What do you put in, you know, a cup or a bowl or a plate? These are different things. So it says something about not only the form, but the cuisine that people are eating and what they need um, for these objects to do for them. Um, so at Lamini, 15 unique ceramic forms were identified. The highest frequency were bowls, teacups, plates, and saucers. Um, very few pipe fragment fragments were recovered, um, which it was 0.7% of the total uh, ceramic assemblage, which was kind of strange. Uh, usually it's higher than that, but Again, don't know why until we do more research. At San Pedro, 22 unique ceramic forms were identified. Um, the high frequency forms were similar to lamini, plates, plates, bowls, saucers, teacups, but 143 smoking pipe fragments were recovered, 14.2% of the total ceramic assemblage. Um, and if you kind of look at the sites too, this is a very small site. It's like half an acre compared to 200 acres. So something kind of weird is going on here, but we don't know exactly what. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, interestingly, chamber pot sherds made up the fifth largest or fifth, fifth most frequent object form, 4.6% of, of the San Pedro assemblage. Uh, the large number of chamber pot, pot, pots and the wide variety of forms, uh, both ceramics and glass, or, which we're not going over today, really suggests not a single family household, but rather a boarding house or communal dump was located on the property in the mid to late. Um, 19th century, but the high frequency of chamber pots may also be utilitarian. Um, there's simply much less private outdoor space to go. Um, and so it might have been that more people had to use indoor facilities. So just to be kind of um, blunt about it, it might have been practical and, and maybe social as well um, to not be going outside. So ceramic decoration. Um, 12 decoration um, types were identified at Lamini. Um, although that number is higher if each individual color is also counted. So if you look here, 
Um, let me try to find one. This is trans a transfer print. It's purple. This is a transfer print. It's blue, right? So transfer print also has different colors. So that's why I've, I've, I've shown you those two numbers. Um, the most frequent types were transfer printed, glazed, banded, and sponged, um, and which included cut sponge as well. Um, any questions you have, by the way, you can send me. I'm just kind of going through this very quickly, but um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, at San Pedro, 22 ceramic decoration types were identified, although again, that number is higher if each color is counted. Um, and the same types of, of um, uh, decoration were, were observed at both sites. Again, here, the sheer number of different decoration types at San Pedro suggests either multiple households or restaurant or boarding facility. Um, and the reason this would be is these, uh, especially like a boarding house or a restaurant, would frequently have to buy new um, new pieces to replace broken or chipped items um, due to sustained um, use. So um, resulting in a more variable um, archaeological record. Um, so just quickly, I wanted to go over faunal here. Um, this very much matches what we're seeing in the rest of the lines of evidence. Um, at Lamanai, um, there were 74% were wild specimens. At San Pedro, 67% were wild specimens. Um, one of the problems here, oh, and I'll mention down here, uh, Lamanai had 26 taxa and San Pedro had 46 taxa, so di completely different types of animals. Um, there is very, very acidic soil at Lamanai. Um, this is the type of thing that we would find at San Pedro. You can see these are fish bones that are really, really small, found tons of them. Don't find any at Lamanai, even though it's on a, a lake. Um, they were definitely eating fish. We just don't have any record of it because it just disintegrates and we don't see it. Um, this is um, a jawbone here that we excavated um, and it's, it basically turned to dust uh, almost immediately after we brought it up. But you can see here as compared to um, the San Pedro site, which doesn't have all this pocking, um, you can see here that it's, it's basically just being, being eaten. Um, so preservation is a really important thing to, to have to think about. Um, and so here is my, my slide that I put in on preservation. Um, just to kind of show you, these are basically the same types of artifacts, but you can see how much they've been kind of eaten away. Um, the metals, the ceramics, everything is just really, it looks very different, it looks older. This stuff looks like it could have been broken yesterday. Um, and these are from the mid 1800s. Again, here with the bones, the, this is a turtle and this is a deer. So you can't really compare those. They were just good pictures to show, but you can see the preservation is just is just very terrible um, at Lamanai. So that that does take um, some of the information away from what we can, what we can talk about. Um, so I wanna do a quick wrap up here and then uh, I've got a couple other slides that I wanna do. I'm gonna go a little bit off course. Um, hopefully you will, um, um, uh, enjoy what I'm going to talk about, or maybe at least it's, it's something I've been thinking about recently. Um, so a quick wrap up here. Um, during the 19th century, the settlements at San Pedro and Lamanai were similar to one another in many respects. At both Lamanai and San Pedro, as a standard at most colonial period archaeological sites where people both lived and worked, the most prevalent objects recovered during excavations were materials related to consumptive behaviors and practices, eating, drinking, smoking, um, medicating, um, let's be here, pooping. <laughs> we talked about the, that too. Um, personal items at both sites, and, and I find this interesting and I don't really know why yet. Um, at both sites made up, uh, were made up of less than 5% of the total assemblages. So not a lot of personal items, um, which really suggests temporary seasonal or transient living conditions with co which coincides with the known histories and landscape of the 19th century. Um, while there are many similarities between the uh, sites of San Pedro and Lamanai, there are also key differences. Um, the most obvious being environment, environment and use or activities. Um, Lamanai is an inland forest site that was a sugar plantation. Um, and San Pedro town um, is an island port location that was a coconut plantation. Um, it has also been a port of trade for the majority of its, of its history. And this goes back to pre-colonial times. Although 19th century residents at both sites were consuming wild and domestic foods, um, there was a great deal more variety at San Pedro. 
Um, and as noted earlier, the, the recovery of more disposal sites at Laminar, oh, actually, I did not mention that earlier. I take that back. It's another presentation. Uh, the recovery of more disposal sites at Lamini might change some of these interpretations. Um, so I wanted to kind of mention that as well. Um, the most obvious difference between these site assemblages is the variety of materials. There's a lot more variety um, at San Pedro. So in closing, the key differences between these contexts are natural environment and preservation, material and faunal variety, use of space, and also adding here population density. Material and faunal variation may be due to the accessibility of San Pedro as compared to Lamini, although riverine travel was and continues to be common. Um, so the lack of variation at Lamini may ultimately be due to different drivers, such as economics. Could people afford to buy imported objects? Who was buying? Were individuals purchasing items for themselves or landowners or hotel owners buying materials for laborers and guests? This changes a little bit what our interpretations would be. Um, so clearly more information is needed, uh, but we do have an, a good idea of what was going on during these times. Um, so what I wanted to do before um, I'm gonna wrap up really quickly here, um, I mentioned earlier that the site where I've been working um, which is a Colombian island, although it's right off the coast of Nicaragua, it's about 120 miles off the coast, um, was recently hit by uh, uh, Hurricane Iota. Um, it's located, you can see here, it's, you, it's actually, I had to put the star there because you can't see it. It's only about 8.5 square miles um, in area. It's very, very small. Um, this is just an overhead shot. Um, it's considered two islands. This is Santa Catalina. And this is Old Providence Island. It used to be connected, but during colonial times, um, they dug this out so they could get boats um, around the island faster. Um, and so there's, well, there was a, a pontoon bridge that went over there, but that is, uh, got lost in the hurricane. Um, so just a really, really, really brief history here. I'm not doing it justice at all. Um, in 1629 to 1630, it was settled by the Providence Island Company. It's the same Puritan investors of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So the Mayflower went to Massachusetts and the Seaflower went to Providence. In 1636, the colony was not thriving. Uh, it was approved by the English government to turn to privateering um, or pirates or buccaneers, depending on your point of view, um, where you were from. Um, in 1641, the Spanish defeated the British and took over the colony. Um, it's very remote, so it's a, it would be a hard place to manage. So the, the Spanish kind of left it alone um, after a certain amount of time. And during the 1670s, the islands became a base for English pirates, including Henry Morgan. Um, this is actually supposed to be the island that was the inspiration for Treasure Island, um, the book um, as well. In 1810, Colombian independence, uh, they, uh, uh, Colombia won independence from Spain um, and then also won claim to the islands against Nicaragua in 1629, or sorry, 1929, it was settled by treaty and the island remains a territory of Colombia to this day. Um, so the reason that I'm bringing up this is because of the hurricane and because of being an archeologist there, I really started thinking about the data that we turn in, the things we interpret, the things that we include in our final reports. Well, the pictures that we turn in look a lot like this, uh, pictures of artifacts, um, pictures of faunal materials, um, pictures of units that we would put in. Um, this is a picture of um, a, a site that actually still has wood, um, which was amazing to me. That hardly ever happens. And some nails here. These are the types of things that we turn in. What we don't really turn in is things like this, our, what I would call our B-roll, our fun pictures. But thinking about it, because none of this is there anymore, this is archeological material now, right? This is evidence. What did this place look like before two weeks ago? Um, this is now archeology. span um, This is not something we normally put into our reports, but I think it's something that, that we should think about. You know, the present as future archeological data, um, maybe we need to start turning, you know, and this is, I'm throwing this out there. I don't know the answer to this, right? We all have enough work and enough data, but it's just made me really think about this. Um, this is what it looks like now. Um, this is in the past weeks and pictures that have been taken. Um, this is what one of the keys looks like. This is a completely different landscape. It will be rebuilt, but it will look different. So 
you know, I have those data, so I think I should probably turn them in. Um, this is another overhead shot. This is the separation between the two islands I was telling you about that had, this is the pontoon bridge. Um, this is what it looks like now. Um, again, it will grow back. It will be rebuilt. They've been there for 400 years. Um, this is some more pictures here. This is government house, which surprisingly the, the lower level um, made it. Um, but we go back to these pictures again. This is archaeology now, right? And so it wasn't something that I included in my original report, but I'm going to be adding as an addendum. And then lastly, I wanted to show you, this is the museum that was on the island. It was built in 1850. Um, it has been destroyed along with all of the artifacts. Um, one thing that is, is making me a little bit happy right now is we only had one field season. Most of the archaeology is still in the ground at this point, and it's safe there. Um, so we can get to it that when we need to. Uh, but this is the museum. Um, we took a tour of the museum. Again, B-roll, right? This is what the inside of the museum looked like. It is now archaeology. Um, so again, I think it's something that we need to start rethinking you know, our data um, in a different way. Um, and our B-roll stuff that I normally wouldn't show you these, I didn't even really, I was just snapping pictures, but all of a sudden they're everything because nobody will ever walk through that building again. So just kind of wanted to uh, mention that there. Um, and that is it for today. Um, thank you so much for having me out um, to speak. And um, please let me know if you have any questions.